because I think we've covered a lot of ground for ASEAN and we've heard a lot of things that are very promising. And that's good because we need some uh, optimism and some direction for uh, how to uh, overcome some of, some of the big challenges right now. If we were to step back from our crises and look at uh, some of the very um, fundamental trends in the world, we'd have a great deal of reason for, for optimism, in fact. Uh, the world economy and world society as a whole has become much better off than it was 100 years ago without question. Life expectancy has risen remarkably. Income in the world on average is now $20,000 per person if measured at international prices and about $12,000 per person if measured at market prices. And this is a huge rise of incomes and well-being and uh, quality of diets, protection uh, of health care coverage, and many, many other uh, really fundamental parts of our material life. And what Dr. Zhao described for China, which is absolutely incredible, for 1.4 billion people over a period of 40 years, um, has been achieved not quite at that pace, but very broadly in many parts of the world. And the underlying reason for those improvements is that science, technology, know-how has advanced and continues to advance even at an accelerating rate. So our ability to address practical challenges is really unprecedented right now. Our wealth is unprecedented and our know-how is unprecedented. This is really the fundamental reason for being uh, very optimistic about what we can do and what we should do in the coming years. What we've learned, though, is that there are at least three fundamental problems with the way the world functions. And that's what brings us to this workshop and what brings us to the Sustainable Development Goals. The first is that with all that progress, there are billions of people that have been effectively left behind this progress that are really struggling for a variety of reasons. People live in more remote areas or in very unfavorable geographies or are part of minority groups that have been maltreated within societies or half the population, women and girls that traditionally were not part of the market economy, were part of the household economy and have definitely seen uh, progress but facing a lot of social obstacles still today, which is why one of the Sustainable Development Goals is directed specifically at the issues of gender, SDG 5. So one of the three huge challenges is that we have a rich world and a lot of very poor and suffering people within that world. And that's just, uh, I think for most of our, us, humanly unacceptable. And indeed, when the UN was established in 1948, all of the member states agreed that there should be basic standards of life for every person on the planet because they're people on the planet, because they're human beings. And the world is productive enough to ensure the dignity 
of everybody. And that's why the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was adopted. And I regard us still trying to honor that declaration, which seems to me to be the basic point. So problem number one is the very uneven development, the fact that there is still today uh, a significant part of the world that lives in really abject deprivation. And that's a, a first challenge. And I think it's ethically probably the number one challenge because extreme deprivation in a world of plenty is absolutely uh, destructive of all of our humanity if we don't solve that problem. So that's why SDG 1 is end extreme poverty. Straightforward. And SDG 2, the second highest priority, is end hunger for heaven's sake. Of course, there are big challenges of how to do it, but I will say in a world of wealth and knowledge, this is definitely within reach. It's crazy to my mind that if the average income is $12,000 per capita, there are people living at a few hundred dollars per capita, and the world just goes on as they suffer and die young and face terrible hardships. The second big challenge, the huge challenge, the puzzle that is even harder than the first one conceptually, is that we discovered about 50 years ago that the nature of our economic development, all that wealth that I just talked about, is environmentally destructive because the much vaunted economic processes don't take care of their physical byproducts. And some of them were not understood till 50 or 100 years ago, like greenhouse gases and their effects on climate. That, was, that required a scientific breakthrough of a quite deep order to understand that. It came by the end of the 19th century, and then it took at least uh, 75 years to create measurement systems to verify the science. And we've more or less known from around 1980 that humanity is really changing the climate in ways that could be dangerous. And we're still struggling with that fact because what brought us that wealth in the first place, starting in the 1800s was fossil fuels, and then we discovered about halfway through, oh, those are dangerous. That's not good. So this is the second big problem, is that we have an economic system and a set of laws, rules, regulations, a global commons, the open seas, and many other factors of our economic system that mean that uh, the scale of production is now self-destructive. And as I say, we've understood this intellectually at least for 70, uh, at least for about 50 years. Uh, it was 50 years ago that the first conference on this fact took hold. It was 51 years ago that the first good book about this limits to growth was written and made clear that there was a real problem. And we've not finished solving that problem. But let me stipulate the following, just like I did for the first one. There's nothing fundamental about these environmental challenges that is beyond our solution, even with our current knowledge base. In other words, we already, in 2023, have the range of technical solutions to 90% of the greenhouse gases, not 100%. We definitely don't face a choice between food and nature. We ch face a choice between, uh, un between destructive and non-destructive forms of food production. That's a very different choice. 
I haven't found in 40 years of my work on this a fundamental barrier to economic well-being and environmental sustainability. So I'm not in the degrowth school of thought, which says that what we really need is to reverse economic development. Not all economic development is good for human well-being. That's a different matter. But I'm not of the school of thought that says we've created a kind of society that is completely inconsistent with our environmental necessities or our environmental well-being or health. What we have is a very flawed economic system, legal system, regulatory system, incentive structure, so that we adopt or continue with technologies that are very ill-advised and do lots of stupid things because it's possible to make money off of those stupid things rather than do the things that we should be doing. And I've not seen in all of my experience any calculations that show me that, this, that doing the right things is beyond our reach, beyond our budget, beyond our uh, economic means. For example, all of the estimates about the energy transformation to a zero carbon energy system suggests that it's one or two percent of world output that is needed to make that change. That's really strange. It's not that it's 50 percent of world output that's needed. It's not that this is cataclysmically expensive and we're just doomed as if an asteroid were coming to hit the planet and we have nothing to do. No, we have clear, very, very clear things to do. Sometimes we have too many possible things to do so we don't know which one to take, so we're paralyzed. Should we do wind or solar or nuclear or this? I don't know. We won't do anything right now. We're making money with what we're doing. Oh, so we're paralyzed, or we know what to do, but there are strong vested interests saying don't do it because I'm making too much money in the short term doing the destructive things, or it just is complicated and hasn't been thought out properly because this is something absolutely new. It was rather straightforward to build a coal plant but it's not so straightforward, perhaps, to build offshore wind or solar fields or something else because of storage or other issues. So there are just complexities. But that's the second big category of challenge that we face, which is this economic environmental collision course, which, again, needs analysis and then needs to ask, how deep is the problem? And for me, and how solvable is the problem? So the climate crisis is very deep, but it's also rather solvable. And there are some puzzles, definitely. What should big ocean tankers run on? Should it be hydrogen fuel cells? Should it be ammonia? Should it be hydrogen combustion? I'm not an engineer. I've heard the arguments from the engineers. I want them to fight it out. I want them to try different approaches, but clearly we should be trying these technology lines. The th third big challenge, which is a challenge of time immemorial, is that we seem to have a very hard time to stop killing each other. So war becomes all ever more dangerous because the weapons become ever more destructive. And now we're technologically so smart that we figured out how to destroy the whole humanity. Damn it. 
If we weren't so smart, we wouldn't have this trouble. But a few geniuses figured out you could make nuclear fission work to make a bomb. By the way, there were probably 50 people in the world that understood that. And they figured it out, and then they gave it to a world of idiots. So we have a lot of dumb people who are in charge of nuclear weapons, and they were made by a few geniuses. That's our problem. So this is our third issue, which is how to stay peaceful and cooperative. To my mind, these are the three big issues that we face, which is how to be fair and decent to people who are suffering, how to make sure that we're not self-destructive because our economic system is actually a complicated set of incentives that doesn't get things right, and there's no magic in how we have organized our economic life to handle issues like greenhouse gases, which weren't in Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations and are not part of the uh, things that uh, a free market can solve, and so forth. And the third is this interminable problem that if you read human history, we've been fighting with each other most of the time. But there are also glimmers of hope that there are long periods of peace. And we also have institutions for peace, just like we have institutions for war. One of the things that makes me quite optimistic about China's rise is that China has been much more peaceful in its history than just about any other region of the world. And the amount of interstate war of China over the last 2,000 years is actually quite low. It's basically been wars of uh, pastoralists coming from the north uh, and uh, sedentary farmers trying to fight them off. Uh, and that's been most of China's wars for 2,000 years. If you look at Europe's wars, it was just kill each other across the divide for a thousand years, nonstop. Um, so China at least has a peaceful tradition, and I think it fits actually with this idea of harmonious uh, society, with the idea of uh, global civilizations and so forth. I'm quite an optimist, I have to say, about that, because I think it uh, actually there's a, a deep rootedness. So that's all we have to do. End poverty, protect the environment, stop killing with each other. All right? So thank you. No, OK. So, no. so what do we do? To my mind, the basic thing is we should think hard about each of those things, and then come up with plans. That's the most basic idea. That sounds so dumb. Why am I saying that after 40 years? Don't I have anything more intelligent to say? And the thing is that the way that our social systems work is not to think and then solve these things. And that's very interesting. Our economic system is designed around a different principle, which is let people do what they want, get rich, go find your job, go uh, buy what you want, but not solve problems. So in economic land, it's not oriented towards solving problems. It's oriented towards doing your thing. Businesses are supposed to go make profits, and we're supposed to be good consumers, and we're supposed to be smart in the job that we pursue. But at least in market economics, which is, became the dominant uh, ideology of the Anglo-Saxon world and then the world, it isn't to solve problems. It's go do your thing. So don't expect the answers to these problems to come from the economic sphere or from the business community. It's not their job. 
Their job is to run a business. It's to make money. So that's problem number one, that we don't think in the economic sphere about end goals. We're supposed to just do our thing. And then politicians. In most politics, it's not about solving problems. It's about maintaining power. And that's even the goal. And you have experts on maintaining power. All the politicians have little Machiavellis around them, handing them, this is what you need to do to stay in power. And that's your goal. And so politics, at least in my country, has very little to do with any goals. I don't know what any American goals are. We have no goals. We have some heroes, our founding fathers. We love the Constitution. We like the July 4th Independence Day. But we have no goals. And even when I hear Dr. Zhao talk about China's goals, you could not have that in the United States, stating those goals. Because that's, that's, that's socialism. Uh, you're not allowed to have goals. So politics is not oriented towards solving problems, really. It's management, management of power, competition for power holding on to power, benefiting from power. And so we don't see from our governments most of the time these big goals and how to solve them. I really think China's been different in this period, the last 40 years, from most other governments. And I think the success is a result of that, actually, that it's really, and why? Well, I think this is a very interesting question, but um, a few countries at a few times have very clear goals, maybe because of survival, maybe because of their past history, maybe because they have a successful uh, neighbor, uh, so they want to imitate the success, maybe like in Singapore, because uh, a genius came. Uh, Lee Kuan Yew, and he had a very, very clear idea. And really, Singapore, it is a case of a very clear, brilliant thinker who just guided things for quite a while, like uh, Plato's philosopher King. But most of the time, this is not how politics is. So we don't see a lot of this problem solving coming from governments. And the third thing is, in my country, which became the most powerful country in the world for uh, the last 75 years militarily, they really think that fighting wars is a big part of what governance is about. They're crazy and dangerous and could get us all killed. So that third category of just peaceful cooperation does not come easily. Every day we read something hateful about China in the American newspapers now, every single day. I just read uh, today, China has the Global Civilizations Initiative. Wonderful. You talked about it. Today I just read, this is terrible. This is, you know, out to, China's out to take over the world through this. <laughs> now, honestly, this is a mindset that is very, very deep, probably ingrained evolutionarily in us also, because there probably was a time when whoever could control the next water hole survived, and whoever didn't, didn't survive, and it was us or them. And that's not how the world is right now. It's not us or them. We don't need to take over any other place to have well-being, period. There's no crisis of living room. There is only the crisis of understanding, don't kill the other side. 
Okay, so what do we do? Again, just to conclude, we need to think clearly. Excuse me. That's a technical term about American politics. So we need really to put serious ideas forward in detail. And that's the purpose of what uh, we're after and two specific pathways that we're really focusing on right now is one is the energy transition because there's only a quarter century and an energy system's really complicated. You have to have a power grid. We have to convert all the vehicles to electric or to hydrogen or to some other non-emitting source. The building sector has to be far more efficient. Industry emits a lot of greenhouse gases. Deforestation, in other words, all of the getting to net zero is quite a complicated challenge with lots of moving parts and it's a lot of money. Not more than, not more than an energy system costs, but an energy system is trillions of dollars a year and so it's worth getting right. So that's the first of the pathways. And the second is the land use and ocean use, because we're really so close to destroying everything irreversibly. When the species is lost, it's never coming back. And when the ecosystems are degraded, many of them never return. And if we pass climate thresholds, we're just going to spend the next century in disaster of calamitous sea level rises, storms, heat waves, and so on. So we're very close to that. So those are the two main pathways that we are really focusing on, the biological and its, associated, its association with food production and with other agricultural production. And for this region, that's central because this is a biodiversity uh, garden of Eden and also a biodiversity threatened region intensively. All this beauty and it's being torn down. And it can happen so fast because economies are very, uh, very, very large right now and demands, China could deforest this country just by its demands for tropical hardwoods without a problem unless you take care. So those are the two areas that we really want to focus on. And the final point that I want to say is uh, again about this third category of cooperation. It happens that when you look technically at an energy program or at a ecosystem program, no country can do this by itself. Nothing can be done other than at the local level, but plans need to be transnational without question. So there's a lot of local action, but they have to be part of a broader framework. And that's why this is an ASEAN workshop because ASEAN countries are not only together on the map and not only physical neighbors, but have work to do together because ASEAN countries cannot achieve their goals without working together. And so we need to do this at a transnational planning level. That's hard because there are no elected transnational officials anywhere. All transnational organizations are weak because none of them has an army. None of them has political leaders. We're organized at the national level in the world. That's where the physical force lies. And yet, and that's where the politics generally lies. And yet we have global and regional problems that need 
addressing urgently. The Mekong is not going to be saved one country at a time. It's going to be saved by China, Lao PDR, Cambodia, Vietnam working together. Without question, there's no way to do that one country at a time. It's got to be done in the watershed. The energy system for Malaysia absolutely needs to be integrated with the rest of the region. And those regional institutions are weak politically and organizationally. And they need to be strengthened considerably. And then uh, the question of what region is the right region for this. We're dealing with ASEAN because it's a it, crucial, established regional entity. But I said yesterday, and I'll say it again, I think for the energy sector, RCEP is even more appropriate. That's adding in ASEAN plus China, Japan, Korea, Australia, and New Zealand. The United States would have a fit, by the way. I'll, I'll be done in one minute. <laughs> the US would have a fit. You're cooperating with China? Well, my strong advice to you is cooperate with China closely. And my strong advice to Australia is don't build a submarine base, cooperate with China. And let's not waste money on nuclear submarines right now and raise the tension more. So my own advice is that broader group, and I hope India joins that group, and then we've got a lot of the world together in a way that could actually solve the problems. So sorry for the long rambling, except I believe that all of these problems are solvable. I believe that universities have a unique and extremely important role to play in this, because this is what we should be doing. Training, teaching, educating, researching, policy analysis, and really trying to make politics work the way that it should, which is for the common good. Thank you. Um, is there any hope that the U.S. And, and, and Ukraine are going to be trying to negotiate for some sort of peace agreement with Russia? This is, uh, Kim, not unlike the virus story and that the government lies relentlessly about why we are in this war, what's happening in the war, and therefore uh, what is uh, going to happen. The two, the, the biggest lie is where this war came from. Uh, and uh, I have a view that is deeply founded, I'm going to say, because I know a lot about this over the past 30 years. This is a war, in my view, that arose because the U.S. rather pig-headedly, in other words, relentlessly, stubbornly insisted on pushing NATO eat farther to the east every step of the way. And the Russians kept saying, don't expand NATO towards us. Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that to Ukraine. We don't want your military on our border. You get it? And the United States said, what? We don't hear you. No, don't worry. We're peace loving. We, we love you. We want to destroy you. We want to decolonize you. We want to break you up. We want to do all sorts. But we love you. And we never go to war uh, except in, in uh, bombing Belgrade for uh, seven straight weeks. Uh, and, oh, yeah. And Afghanistan, we occupied for 15 years as NATO and uh, and uh, the Iraq war was unprovoked. And yeah, we tried to overthrow your ally uh, uh, Assad with the CIA regime change operation. And oh yeah, NATO took out Gaddafi. And yeah, yeah, we are placing missiles uh, nearby you uh, in Poland and Romania because we unilaterally uh, abandoned the anti-ballistic missile treaty. But we're, we're peace loving and of course we're gonna move NATO right up to your 2,300 kilometer border, and not just uh, in Ukraine, but we're going to do it in Georgia. Fascinating, by the way. People, please take out a map and look up Georgia, not the one 
uh, uh, in uh, next to Florida, uh, but uh, Georgia in uh, the Black Sea on the eastern boundary of the Black Sea, because that country is not a North Atlantic country. So why would it ever be in NATO? And yet the United States wants to push NATO to Georgia. And if you look at a map, I can explain in 30 seconds why that is, because the intention of the United States is to surround Russia in the Black Sea. Ukraine, Romania, Bulgaria, Turkey, and Georgia creates an encirclement. And Russia's naval fleet, the Black Sea warm water naval fleet is in Sevastopol, Crimea. And it's been there, by the way, since 1783. And there was already one major war in the 19th century between 1853 and 1856, where the British had the idea, get rid of that naval fleet. And in the late 20th centuries, Big New Brzezinski had the same idea of surround Russia uh, by getting Ukraine into the Western camp and actually into NATO. And then Russia ceases to be a major power is their theory. Well, to make a long story short, this is uh, the major reason for this war and we've never been told the truth about it. And that is really devastating. Second closely related issue is that in February, 2014, the US uh, conspired to overthrow the government of Ukraine and it did so. That's not a good move. If you're trying to push NATO and there's a president named Viktor Yanukovych who wanted neutrality and you get together with forces inside the country and you uh, support the overthrow of Yanukovych, the violent overthrow, not a good look. That's when this war started in February 2014. And then if you look at the real sequence of events, not the not, not the uh, uh, mind deadening uh, repeated mantra of the US government and the New York Times and blah, 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 that this is an unprovoked attack that started in February, 2021, uh, which 2022, excuse me, which is a nonsense. This isn't an unprovoked attack and it didn't start then, it started in 2014, but in 2019 onward, the U.S. poured in armaments to build up a very, very powerful army. And when Biden came in, he doubled down on this whole thing because Biden and his team, Sullivan, Blinken, Newland, have been part of this story since 2014 and really before because Biden's always been a an advocate of NATO enlargement. Biden's got some dark side still to be explained about Ukraine as well because of Hunter's involvement. We don't know what that is yet, but there's something not good at all about that. But I think mm -hmm. Newland has been on this case of NATO enlargement. She was actually the ambassador under Bush Jr. in 2008 to where? To NATO. In the 2008 meeting, when the U.S. pushed the proposition and forced everyone to agree that Ukraine would become a member of NATO. So Newland's been part of this story from way back when, from the Cheney Bush days, uh, and uh, she continued through the Obama administration days as the point person for the overthrow of Yanukovych in the U.S. government and for the NATO enlargement issues. And then we started arming Ukraine heavily, especially in the late uh, 2010s. And then Biden really doubled down when he became president and repeated, uh, repeated uh, actually in several high level processes that Ukraine will become a member of NATO. And to bring us to today, and just to conclude on December 17th, 2021, President Putin tabled a Russia-NATO security agreement in a draft 
based on no more NATO enlargement. And I happened to call the White House after that and said, avoid a war, negotiate. It's not even a concession. Why do we want NATO in Ukraine? It's going to provoke disaster. And I was told, oh, don't worry about it, Professor Sachs, but we'll never negotiate over NATO enlargement. It's none of Russia's business. And I said, none of Russia's business. Are you kidding? It's their border, 2,300 kilometers. How can it not be their business where the American military alliance is? But we are so arrogant that uh, we treated it as if don't have to talk to Russia about it. Then as soon as this uh, special military operation was launched in February 2022, Zelensky said, OK, OK, I could we could be neutral. And they actually exchanged documents, drafts and negotiated a peace arrangement a year and a half ago in March 2022. And I talked to the negotiators, by the way, I talked to the mediators, the Turkish government in detail. And you know what happened? The United States came in and told Zelensky, no, you don't agree to neutrality. You fight on. We're, we have your back. You're going to win. You defeat Russia. OK, now there are hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians dead. This counteroffensive of uh, June, July, August and September is a killing field. Ukraine doesn't have the weapons, the manpower, the training, the air cover, the artillery to do this, even if it were desirable to do, they don't have it. So they're getting smashed. And Biden doesn't have the gumption to say, you know, this was a terrible blunder. We need to agree that NATO won't enlarge and save Ukraine but rather, oh, we're all with you for as long as it takes, meaning how many more hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians dead as long as it takes? Oh, come on, I'm 68 years old. I know what it means as long as it takes. It means some moment the US leaves. That's what it means as long as it takes with a lot of dead in Ukraine in a country that has been absolutely pummeled by artillery nonstop, basically, on both sides since February, 2024, uh, 2022, but with a lot of shooting and killing that took place since February uh, 2014. This is terrible. This is destroying Ukraine. This isn't protecting Ukraine. And so this is the real story. But again, the government lies to us. We don't get to debate it. And if you say it, you know, you're a, a, you're a Putin propagandist, you're called. But I have written an op-ed in the last couple of days that I've uh, put online, where the Secretary General of NATO himself, someone I know quite well for a long time, Jens Stoltenberg, said when he was speaking in the European Parliament that Putin went to war to stop NATO enlargement. But we don't have to negotiate with him. Well, great favor to Ukraine. It's interesting. I'm just looking at this map from what you're saying. And yeah, uh, NATO has successfully, nearly successfully, completely cut Russia off from various bodies of water. I mean, you've got the Black Sea, what you're mentioning, and if they could get Georgia uh, and the rest of Ukraine, and, you know, they, then they'll have every other area around that Black Sea. The Baltic Sea yep. as well. They, yep. they've you got cut it. them off from the Baltic Sea. They got it with Finland. These, these are choke um, points. Yeah, right. What, what, why do you think they're trying to do that? What is the, why cut them off from the, the Black Sea or the Baltic Sea? I'm curious if the Caspian Sea is next. I mean, is yeah. that what you think they're going to go after that one as well? Look, I, I don't know if uh, you have uh, used to play Risk. You, uh, do you know that board game? Uh, yeah, it was a yeah. board game of, of my youth. Uh, the idea was to have your piece on every uh, part of the world map. Then you had taken over the world. Well, that that's uh, that's the neocon uh, vision. They're playing risk, uh, playing risk at the expense of uh, of vast numbers of deaths in many parts of the world. They want to have the U.S. military or subservient governments or supplicant governments or pliant governments everywhere on the map of the world. 
and uh, this is pretty relentless. Uh, and it's a, it's kind of manifest destiny writ at the global scale. It used to be at the continental scale. Nothing can stop us. We take over all of North America, uh, Native Americans notwithstanding, uh, and so forth. Uh, this is a manifest destiny at the global level. Uh, the only problem is others don't quite share this idea, and uh, we are getting into an awful lot of wars, and they're very dangerous, very dangerous. This is a war with a nuclear superpower and obviously a very powerful military. And uh, Russia has 6,000 nuclear warheads. And they're gunning after China, at least a lot of politicians in Washington. I think in the last few weeks, Biden is trying to pull back a little bit, I think, from the brink, uh, but scared always of his right flank that he'll be attacked for being soft on China and so forth. But there are a lot of hardliners on China that seem really to be preparing for war. Can you imagine anything more reckless, stupid, unnecessary, potentially uh, Armageddon than that? I can't. So all of this is mind boggling to me. But the basic answer to your question is no rational reason other than that they think they're playing global hegemon and they need their peace on every part of the map. What happened to Western values? Because it's a very uh, interesting and important and strange story in a way. And it's uh, worth uh, reflecting on. The values that we heard about uh, both Buddhist and Confucian thought clearly find some resonance in Christian thought, uh, especially in uh, gospel teachings uh, of Jesus, and also in Greek thought. Uh, because if you look at uh, Aristotle's uh, philosophy, as was seen, you would find some connections that are quite important, actually, and I want to draw them out. But then Western philosophy took an odd turn or Western thinking took an odd turn. And it's important to understand that change of values that took place starting around 1500 to uh, today, because there really was a change of the uh, Western philosophical approach and a divergence that uh, is, I think, quite harmful uh, in many ways. So if you look at uh, Aristotle, Buddha, and Confucius, if I might, just very uh, briefly, they're all in deep ways, not the same ways, but deep ways, uh, variants of what can be called virtue ethics. The idea of virtue ethics is that human beings have the potential to do good, not the inevitability of doing good, and that virtues need to be cultivated to bring out the best in human beings. And this is a common idea of Aristotle, Buddha, and Confucius in the teachings. Uh, in uh, Buddha's uh, Eightfold Noble Path. Uh, there is the idea of the right view, the right action, the right speech, the right livelihood, and so on, uh, as ways to cultivate the underlying virtues. Aristotle was very, very clear that happiness depends on virtue, but virtue must be cultivated. It cannot be taken for granted. And the main virtues in the Greek thought were virtues of what's called practical wisdom or phronesis, which was the ability to choose the good over the enticing, temperance, which is moderation, uh, which is a common virtue across all of these philosophies. Uh, 
bravery, which means the ability to defend the good, and justice, the uh, ability to discern the right allocation for each person. And so those became the cardinal virtues in Western thought. But what was key for Aristotle was the idea that being virtuous is a potential of human beings, not a inevitability because we are all bound by our bodily temptations, by our animal instincts, but also by our reason. So in Western Greek thought, reason was the predominant notion. This is not the same as in Eastern thought, but it comes to some similar points. And Aristotle said one must develop the habits of virtue. In fact, virtue or ethics comes from the word habit in Greek, that you practice just as we heard, uh, that you become altruistic by practicing uh, altruistic acts. And Aristotle believed in mentorship, in education, in practice, in life experience as being vital. So here is a common basis that merges East and West virtue traditions at a quite deep level. And Christian thought, especially the teachings of Jesus himself as in the Gospels, are not the same basis. Uh, it's not exactly virtue ethics, but it is, of course, the virtues that are proposed, and especially also uh, the Confucian golden rule is also Jesus's golden rule, although Jesus states it positively, do to others what you would have them do to you, and love thy neighbor as uh, you love yourself. And that led in the early centuries of Christianity to a tremendous institutional focus of the bishops and the monasteries to care for the poor. And that was a real point because uh, the Christian communities, the emperors took care of their business and the bishops took care of the poor in a division of uh, responsibility that started around the fourth century AD in the West. Skipping ahead a thousand years, things Philosophy changed uh, starting around 1500 in a rather deep way. And while Aristotle taught, for example, that politics is a field of ethics, and Aristotle's book, The Politics, which is the first book of Western political thought, no, let me say it. it's the first book of Western political science is the better way to say it because Plato had written the Republic a generation earlier. But it's the first book of political science. It is paired with his ethics, Nicomachean ethics, as two joined volumes because for Aristotle, ethics and politics were the same. Of course, in 15... 14, I think it is, Machiavelli wrote a very different political science. He wrote a handbook for the prince, which was about how to maintain power. And political science in the West began to be the science of maintaining or managing power, not the science of producing the good. And in fact, Machiavelli was teaching the prince. He was actually making a job application back to the Medicis because he had been dismissed from the Medicis, wanting a job back that he was advising the Medicis how to hold power in Florence. Later in the next century, one of the most influential texts in Western cultural history was written by Thomas Hobbes, the Leviathan. And this was written in 1640 as Western science was 
taking shape, and Hobbes wanted a scientific theory of human beings, but modeled as individual atoms that collide with each other. Because for Hobbes, there was no longer a cultivation of virtue, but rather each individual with insatiable desires. So Hobbes's model of human nature is that it is simply unbounded desire. It can't be taught to moderate desire. It can't be cultivated for virtue. It is individualistic and it is insatiable. And so Hobbes said, unless there is an overarching power people will kill each other. And so we need a Leviathan, he said, to stop human nature from committing non-stop violence. It was a very pessimistic view of human nature, but notice the main point is no longer was there any idea of developing virtue. That was deemed to be impossible. Instead, one needed institutions to reflect harsh reality. This is the flip of philosophy. It's no longer about cultivating the good, it is about controlling the bad. Then interestingly and importantly, this was amplified at the beginning of the 18th century first by a very uh, influential public intellectual, Bernard Mandeville, who wrote an essay in London called The Fable of the Bees. And in The Fable of the Bees, the most aggressive bees win, but they make the hive powerful and great. And if you try to control the avarice or the vice or the aggression of the bees, the hive actually dies. So this was now a philosophy of empire, that power seeking was good because it would make the society powerful and wealthy and able to dominate over the other bees. So it was taking Hobbes and adding another element, one beehive taking dominance over others. And clearly this was a philosophy that appealed to the emerging British Empire. Then came Adam Smith six decades later in 1776. And he said, in agreement with Hobbes and in agreement with Mandeville, that human nature is individualistic, Tastes are unbounded. Desire is a great motivator. But market forces will tame all of that because market forces will force a kind of competition that will lead to a socially beneficent outcome. The point is the Anglo-Saxon philosophy broke free of more than 1,800 years of Western tradition. The Western tradition from Aristotle and Christianity was a tradition of the common good, virtue, and care for the poor. By the, with the rise of the British Empire, the philosophy came, became the benefits of power as a philosophy. And then even the idea that this would lead to, quote, the common good. But there are two more steps that are important to state. The poor became an enemy because now they were a drag on society. So John Locke, one of our most esteemed philosophers, wanted very harsh treatment for the poor so that they would not be burdens on society. And then came Malthus. Thomas Malthus wrote after Adam Smith one generation later in 1798. And he proposed something even darker 
which is that those hives, those different societies, are actually in competition for survival with each other because there are more people produced than can be supported. And so life is a battle for survival. And trying to help the poor is inevitably to fail because there will just be more poor people. That was his iron law of population. And it's that led in the next step. Darwin took that idea brilliantly from a scientific point of view to understand natural selection. But the later 19th century philosophers took that idea as a struggle across nations. And that now nations or peoples or races were in the struggle for survival. And this became known as social Darwinism. And the idea was not only should there be no beneficence, if you help your own poor, you will weaken your society compared to others. And indeed, you're in a struggle for survival. And this gave rise to the worst crimes of history. Because Nazism actually is a philosophy, which it was, was based on social Darwinist pseudoscience. And this idea, the German people will survive or the Slavic people will survive. And so this is a war even to extermination. Now this kind of idea led to the worst cruelties, but we are still in a mindset in the Western world where it is competition and struggle that is the absolute underpinning of society. When I studied economics, I was taught about perfect competition. I was never taught even one minute about perfect cooperation. The idea doesn't even exist in economics. It's not even developed in one paper that I know of because the idea of cooperation as a norm doesn't exist. It happened, this notion of letting greed motivate action perhaps did generate the spirit of innovation to some extent. But the way that it was championed and taught, of course, led to the worst excesses. So the world became rich, and those who were rich became devoid of benevolence and compassion. And a terrible writer in the United States who became quite popular, Ayn Rand, a kind of uh, popular philosopher among young people and among many politicians, wrote a famous essay about the virtues of selfishness. So selfishness became the virtue, actually. That's the literal title of an essay. It's unbelievable. And she is championed by many still. These novels are unbearable to read, but they are part of our philosophy. So I went on too long, I know, because the sign told me to stop five minutes ago. But, so that's not very benevolent of me. But let me say the following. I believe we've had a deviation from the right path in Western civilization. There are roots of Western culture that we can really use to find a path of virtue and politics that is ethical. But the Anglo-Saxon version deeply lost this tradition. And there are many fascinating reasons for this, but it was mainly the rise of power of the British Empire. 
which was in many ways an extremely nasty empire. And the United States learned everything it knows from the British Empire because it aims to be the continuation of the British Empire after World War II. And this is what needs to end, a world that can return to the common ethical principles of virtue. Now, let me just conclude by saying I am hopeful that this can actually happen. And I think you at the table need to help lead that. And we need to help explain these things. And when President Xi Jinping launched last year the Global Civilizations Initiative, I think that this is actually an important opening that is very positive because China has said we should go back to our roots of culture to find a way forward, which I very much subscribe to. And the GCI, or Global Civilizations Initiative, is an invitation across civilizational wisdom. And I hosted a meeting in Athens last month, co-hosted with the Academy of Athens, a Aristotle Confucius symposium on ancient wisdom for modern challenges that brought together Chinese and Western philosophers. We didn't have Buddha properly at the table except one very distinguished Buddhist thinker from Cambodia, but we need more of that. At the end of this meeting, we agreed that we would have a second symposium. This time, I hope it is the Aristotle Buddha Confucius Symposium in Shufu, uh, in Shandong province in July. I hope we could participate together in that. Uh, we will be back for that. Many philosophers are interested in that. I will be in Shufu in next month uh, for the Nishan uh, Forum, which is uh, also a philosophical forum, but the Shandong government has asked to host the follow-up meeting of the Aristotle, Buddha, Confucius uh, Symposium. And I believe that this idea of East and West deep philosophical traditions finding the deep humanity that is common across them is extremely important and powerful and can really contribute to an understanding which right now doesn't exist. And I think the failings of this understanding are overwhelmingly on the Western side, if I may say so, because we are steeped in a philosophy of competition and even war. And this mindset is taken as given, but it is actually a recent phenomenon. It is an imperial phenomenon and it needs to be put aside. So I, I believe that this actually can be done. Can I have two more minutes? <laughs> because I want to talk about net zero by 2050. And first to say how much I admire what Dr. Shaw proposed and uh, I, is the book in English also, or in Chinese? Okay, we're going to have to get me an English translation somehow, uh, if we can, <laughs> but I'm very eager also to read your forthcoming paper. Let me add a couple of things that I think are central, but I think they're already exactly in your uh, climate club idea. It is not possible to reach net zero one country at a time, least of all for an island. We need an interconnected energy system, region by region, because if you are tapping renewable energy, it's intermittent. So it's sunny here or windy here, 
This needs interconnection. And East Asia should be interconnected in a common grid. There is a mainland China program called GuideCo. cooperation organization that is the China state grid engineers who are doing analytical work on interconnecting regional grids for Africa, for South America, for North America, for Europe, and for Asia. This is very important work. Taiwan should be connected to the mainland in a power grid. And the mainland should be connected with Mongolia, and it should be connected with the ASEAN countries, and with submarine system. It would be very region, the economic powerhouse of the world, rather than a battleground, because this region has everything if it works together. And it could lose everything if it views the region as a battleground. I think everyone in this region can understand this. The only one that does not is my country, actually. But the U.S. needs to be told, let us solve our problems. We know how to discuss. Don't meddle, because you will make a mess. This is actually the truth. This is true about Japan. of zero carbon energy and all the cooperation that go would the regional cooperation, the regional structure, and pose and probably roadmaps that show the physical interconnectedness, what technologies, where, as I've been saying, of a plan. It's 80% fossil fuel. What plan is that? Nothing. Please, <laughs> don't encourage them. So, show fantastic or work. I was, Sonia and I were just in Beijing with them a couple of days ago. We'll come back for a meeting that they're hosting on September 26th uh, for a worldwide meeting on energy interconnections. I think that this is really uh, uh, ab absolutely at the core. So I agree with everything that you said, and I think that it's absolutely the way forward, and in that polycentric world, there's a concept which I find very useful. It's a concept adopted by the European Union, but a concept that actually started with the Roman Catholic Church, and that is the concept of subsidiarity.
which is that we need governance at all levels. So we need global governance, regional governance, national governance, local governance. You put each problem at the lowest level possible, closest to the people, where it can be solved, but not below the level at which it can be solved. So the power grid cannot be solved at the national level. It must be solved at the regional level. The targets for decarbonization must be solved at the global level, and so forth. And the idea of subsidiarity is that we have this multiple levels. We have global governance. We have a global government that can do certain things and not other things. We have regional government. We have national government. We have local government. because I think we've covered a lot of ground for ASEAN and we've heard a lot of things that are very promising. And that's good because we need some uh, optimism and some direction for uh, how to uh, overcome some of, some of the big challenges right now. If we were to step back from our crises and look at uh, some of the very um, fundamental trends in the world, we'd have a great deal of reason for, for optimism, in fact. Uh, the world economy and world society as a whole has become much better off than it was 100 years ago without question. Life expectancy has risen remarkably, income in the world on average is now $20,000 per person if measured at international prices and about $12,000 per person if measured at market prices. And this is a huge rise of incomes and well-being and uh, quality of diets, protection, uh, of health care coverage and many, many other uh, really fundamental parts of our material life. And what Dr. Zhao described for China, which is absolutely incredible, for uh, 1.4 billion people over a period of 40 years, um, has been achieved not quite at that pace, but very broadly in many parts of the world. And the underlying reason for those improvements is that science, technology, know-how has advanced and continues to advance even at an accelerating rate. So our ability to address practical challenges is really unprecedented right now. Our wealth is unprecedented and our know-how is unprecedented. This is really the fundamental reason for being uh, very optimistic about what we can do and what we should do in the coming years. What we've learned, though, is that there are at least three fundamental problems with the way the world functions. And that's what brings us to this workshop and what brings us to the sustainable development goals. The first is that with all that progress, there are billions of people that have been effectively left behind this progress that are really struggling for a variety of reasons. People live in more remote areas or in very unfavorable geographies or are part of minority groups that have been maltreated within societies or half the population, women and girls that traditionally were not part of the market economy, were part of the household economy and have 
definitely seen uh, progress, but facing a lot of social obstacles still today, which is why one of the sustainable development goals is directed specifically at the issues of gender, SDG 5. So one of the three huge challenges is that we have a rich world and a lot of very poor and suffering people within that world. And that's just, uh, I think for most of our, us, humanly unacceptable. And indeed, when the UN was established in 1948, all of the member states agreed that there should be basic standards of life for every person on the planet because they're people on the planet, because they're human beings. And the world is productive enough to ensure the dignity of everybody. And that's why the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was adopted. And I regard us still trying to honor that declaration, which seems to me to be the basic point. So problem number one is the very uneven development, the fact that there is still today uh, a significant part of the world that lives in really abject deprivation. And that's a, a first challenge. And I think it's ethically probably the number one challenge because extreme deprivation in a world of plenty is absolutely uh, destructive of all of our humanity if we don't solve that problem. So that's why SDG 1 is end extreme poverty. Straightforward. And SDG 2, the second highest priority, is end hunger for heaven's sake. Of course, there are big challenges of how to do it, but I will say in a world of wealth and knowledge, this is definitely within reach. It's crazy to my mind that if the average income is $12,000 per capita, there are people living at a few hundred dollars per capita and the world just goes on as they suffer and die young and face terrible hardships. The second big challenge, the huge challenge, the puzzle that is even harder than the first one conceptually is that we discovered about 50 years ago that the nature of our economic development, all that wealth that I just talked about, is environmentally destructive because the much vaunted economic processes don't take care of their physical byproducts. And some of them were not understood till 50 or 100 years ago, like greenhouse gases and their effects on climate. That, was, that required a scientific breakthrough of a quite deep order to understand that. It came by the end of the 19th century, and then it took at least uh, 75 years to create measurement systems to verify the science. And we've more or less known from around 1980 that humanity is really changing the climate in ways that could be dangerous. And we're still struggling with that fact because what brought us that wealth in the first place, starting in the 1800s, was fossil fuels. And then we discovered about halfway through, oh, those are dangerous. That's not good. So this is the second big problem, is that we have an economic system and a set of laws, rules, regulations, a global commons, the open seas, and many other factors of our economic system that mean that uh, the scale of production is now self-destructive. And as I say, we've understood this intellectually at least for 70, uh, at least for about 50 years. Uh, it was 50 years ago that the first conference on this fact took hold. It was 51 years ago that the first good book 
about this limits to growth was written and made clear that there was a real problem. And we've not finished solving that problem. But let me stipulate the following, just like I did for the first one. There's nothing fundamental about these environmental challenges that is beyond our solution, even with our current knowledge base. In other words, we already in 2023 have the range of technical solutions to 90% of the greenhouse gases, not 100%. We definitely don't face a choice between food and nature. We face a choice between, uh, un between destructive and non-destructive forms of food production. That's a very different choice. I haven't found in 40 years of my work on this a fundamental barrier to economic well-being and environmental sustainability. So I'm not in the degrowth school of thought, which says that what we really need is to reverse economic development. Not all economic development is good for human well-being. That's a different matter. But I'm not of the school of thought that says we've created a kind of society that is completely inconsistent with our environmental necessities or our environmental well-being or health. What we have is a very flawed economic system, legal system, regulatory system, incentive structure, so that we adopt or continue with technologies that are very ill-advised and do lots of stupid things because it's possible to make money off of those stupid things rather than do the things that we should be doing. And I've not seen in all of my experience any calculations that show me that, this, that doing the right things is beyond our reach, beyond our budget, beyond our uh, economic means. For example, all of the estimates about the energy transformation to a zero carbon energy system suggests that it's one or 2% of world output that is needed to make that change. That's really strange. It's not that it's 50% of world output that's needed. It's not that this is cataclysmically expensive and we're just doomed as if an asteroid were coming to hit the planet and we have nothing to do. No, we have clear, very, very clear things to do. Sometimes we have too many possible things to do so we don't know which one to take, so we're paralyzed. Should we do wind or solar or nuclear or this? I don't know. We won't do anything right now. We're making money with what we're doing. So we're paralyzed. Or we know what to do, but there are strong vested interests saying don't do it because I'm making too much money in the short term doing the destructive things. Or it just is complicated and hasn't been thought out properly because this is something absolutely new. It was rather straightforward to build a coal plant, but it's not so straightforward, perhaps, to build offshore wind or solar fields or something else because of storage or other issues. So there are just complexities. But that's the second big category of challenge that we face, which is this economic environmental collision course which again needs analysis and then needs to ask how deep is the problem and for me and how solvable is the problem so the climate crisis is very deep but it's also rather solvable and there are some puzzles definitely 
what should big ocean tankers run on? Should it be hydrogen fuel cells? Should it be ammonia? Should it be hydrogen combustion? I'm not an engineer. I've heard the arguments from the engineers. I want them to fight it out. I want them to try different approaches, but clearly we should be trying these technology lines. The th third big challenge, which is a challenge of time immemorial, is that we seem to have a very hard time to stop killing each other. So war becomes all ever more dangerous because the weapons become ever more destructive. And now we're technologically so smart that we figured out how to destroy the whole humanity. Damn it. If we weren't so smart, we wouldn't have this trouble. But a few geniuses figured out you could make nuclear fission work to make a bomb. By the way, there were probably 50 people in the world that understood that. And they figured it out, and then they gave it to a world of idiots. So we have a lot of dumb people who are in charge of nuclear weapons, and they were made by a few geniuses. That's our problem. So this is our third issue, which is how to stay peaceful and cooperative. To my mind, these are the three big issues that we face, which is how to be fair and decent to people who are suffering, how to make sure that we're not self-destructive because our economic system is actually a complicated set of incentives that doesn't get things right, and there's no magic in how we have organized our economic life to handle issues like greenhouse gases, which weren't in Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations and are not part of the uh, things that uh, a free market can solve, and so forth. And the third is this interminable problem that if you read human history, we've been fighting with each other most of the time. But there are also glimmers of hope that there are long periods of peace. And we also have institutions for peace, just like we have institutions for war. One of the things that makes me quite optimistic about China's rise is that China has been much more peaceful in its history than just about any other region of the world. And the amount of interstate war of China over the last 2,000 years is actually quite low. It's basically been wars of uh, pastoralists coming from the north uh, and uh, sedentary farmers trying to fight them off. Uh, and that's been most of China's wars for 2,000 years. If you look at Europe's wars, it was just kill each other across the divide for a thousand years, nonstop. Um, so China at least has a peaceful tradition, and I think it fits actually with this idea of harmonious uh, society, with the idea of uh, global civilizations and so forth. I'm quite an optimist, I have to say, about that, because I think it uh, actually there's a, a deep rootedness. So that's all we have to do. End poverty, protect the environment, stop killing with each other. All right? So, thank you. No, okay. So, no. so what do we do? To my mind, the basic thing is we should think hard about each of those things and then come up with plans. That's the most basic idea. That sounds so dumb. Why am I saying that after 40 years? Don't I have anything more intelligent to say? And the thing is that the way that our social systems work is not to think and then solve these things. And that's very interesting. 
our economic system is designed around a different principle, which is let people do what they want, get rich, go find your job, go uh, buy what you want, but not solve problems. So in economic land, it's not oriented towards solving problems. It's oriented towards doing your thing. <clears throat> Businesses are supposed to go make profits, and we're supposed to be good consumers, and we're supposed to be smart in the job that we pursue. But at least in market economics, which is, became the dominant uh, ideology of the Anglo-Saxon world and then the world, it isn't to solve problems. It's go do your thing. So don't expect the answers to these problems to come from the economic sphere or from the business community. It's not their job. Their job is to run a business. It's to make money. So that's problem number one, that we don't think in the economic sphere about end goals. We're supposed to just do our thing. And then politicians. In most politics, it's not about solving problems. It's about maintaining power. And that's even the goal. And you have experts on maintaining power. All the politicians have little Machiavellis around them, handing them, this is what you need to do to stay in power. And that's your goal. And so politics, at least in my country, has very little to do with any goals. I don't know what any American goals are. We have no goals. We have some heroes, our founding fathers. We love the Constitution. We like the July 4th Independence Day. But we have no goals. And even when I hear Dr. Zhao talk about China's goals, you could not have that in the United States, stating those goals. Because that's, that's, that's socialism. Uh, you're not allowed to have goals. So politics is not oriented towards solving problems, really. It's management, management of power, competition for power holding on to power, benefiting from power. And so we don't see from our governments most of the time these big goals and how to solve them. I really think China's been different in this period, the last 40 years, from most other governments. And I think the success is a result of that, actually, that it's really, and why? Well, I think this is a very interesting question, but um, a few countries at a few times have very clear goals, maybe because of survival, maybe because of their past history, maybe because they have a successful uh, neighbor, uh, so they want to imitate the success, maybe like in Singapore, because uh, a genius came. Uh, Lee Kuan Yew, and he had a very, very clear idea. And really, Singapore, it is a case of a very clear, brilliant thinker who just guided things for quite a while, like uh, Plato's philosopher King. But most of the time, this is not how politics is. So we don't see a lot of this problem solving coming from governments. And the third thing is, in my country, which became the most powerful country in the world for uh, the last 75 years militarily, they really think that fighting wars is a big part of what governance is about. They're crazy and dangerous and could get us all killed. So that third category of just peaceful cooperation does not come easily. Every day we read something hateful about China in the American newspapers now.
every single day. I just read uh, today, China has the Global Civilizations Initiative. Wonderful. You talked about it. Today I just read, this is terrible. This is, you know, out to, China's out to take over the world through this. <laughs> now, honestly, this is a mindset that is very, very deep, probably ingrained evolutionarily in us also, because there probably was a time when whoever could control the next water hole survived, and whoever didn't, didn't survive, and it was us or them. And that's not how the world is right now. It's not us or them. We don't need to take over any other place to have well-being, period. There's no crisis of living room. There is only the crisis of understanding, don't kill the other side. OK, so what do we do? Again, just to conclude, we need to think clearly. Excuse me. That's a technical term about American politics. So we need really to put serious ideas forward in detail. And that's the purpose of what uh, we're after, and two specific pathways that we're really focusing on right now is one is the energy transition, because there's only a quarter century and an energy system's really complicated. You have to have a power grid, we have to convert all the vehicles to electric or to hydrogen or to some other non-emitting source. The building sector has to be far more efficient. Industry emits a lot of greenhouse gases. Deforestation, in other words, all of the getting to net zero is quite a complicated challenge with lots of moving parts and it's a lot of money. Not more than not more than an energy system costs, but an energy system is trillions of dollars a year, and so it's worth getting right. So that's the first of the pathways. And the second is the land use and ocean use, because we're really so close to destroying everything irreversibly. When the species is lost, it's never coming back. And when the ecosystems are degraded, many of them never return. And if we pass climate thresholds, we're just going to spend the next century in disaster of calamitous sea level rises, storms, heat waves, and so on. So we're very close to that. So those are the two main pathways that we are really focusing on. The biological and its, associated, its association with food production and with other agricultural production. And for this region, that's central because this is a biodiversity uh, garden of Eden and also a biodiversity threatened region intensively all this beauty and it's being torn down and it can happen so fast because economies are very uh, very very large right now and demands china could deforest this country just by its demands for tropical hardwoods without a problem unless you take care so those are the two areas that we really want to focus on. And the final point that I want to say is, uh, again, about this third category of cooperation. It happens that when you look technically at an energy program or at an ecosystem program, no country can do this by itself. Nothing can be done other than at the local level, but plans need to be transnational without question. So there's a lot of local action, but they have to be part of a broader framework. And that's why 
this is an ASEAN workshop because ASEAN countries are not only together on the map and not only physical neighbors, but have work to do together because ASEAN countries cannot achieve their goals without working together. And so we need to do this at a transnational planning level. That's hard because there are no elected transnational officials anywhere. All transnational organizations are weak because none of them has an army. None of them has political leaders. We're organized at the national level in the world. That's where the physical force lies. And yet, and that's where the politics generally lies. And yet, we have global and regional problems that need addressing urgently. The Mekong is not going to be saved one country at a time. It's going to be saved by China, Lao PDR, Cambodia, Vietnam working together without question. There's no way to do that one country at a time. It's got to be done in the watershed. The energy system for Malaysia absolutely needs to be integrated with the rest of the region. And those regional institutions are weak politically and organizationally. And they need to be strengthened considerably. And then uh, the question of what region is the right region for this. We're dealing with ASEAN because it's a it, crucial established regional entity. But I said yesterday, and I'll say it again, I think for the energy sector, RCEP is even more appropriate. That's adding in ASEAN plus China, Japan, Korea, Australia, and New Zealand. The United States would have a fit, by the way. I'll, I'll be done in one minute. <laughs> the US would have a fit. You're cooperating with China? Well, my strong advice to you is cooperate with China closely. And my strong advice to Australia is don't build a submarine base, cooperate with China. And let's not waste money on nuclear submarines right now and raise the tension more. So my own advice is that broader group, and I hope India joins that group, and then we've got a lot of the world together in a way that could actually solve the problems. So sorry for the long rambling, except I believe that all of these problems are solvable. I believe that universities have a unique and extremely important role to play in this, because this is what we should be doing. Training, teaching, educating, researching, policy analysis, and really trying to make politics work the way that it should, which is for the common good. Thank you. Would you agree that China is using this Hamiltonian approach uh, to economics, uh, perhaps coming from Sun Yat-sen, whose influence uh, of, uh, who is highly influenced by Hamilton? Well, chi China is, it has uh, what I would simply call a, a mixed economy, which means it's uh, partly state-directed, partly market-directed. I think all successful economies are mixed economies. Uh, and uh, the US, uh, even when it uh, uses uh, free market rhetoric, uh, of course, has a large role of uh, the government, not necessarily accurate uh, role, uh, but uh, a large role of uh, government uh, in, in, in the economy. Different uh, countries come down uh, differently on uh, how they uh, carve up the relative uh, weights and responsibilities of public, uh, private, and civil society sectors. It's true that the uh, UK-US approach is uh, 
relatively more on uh, the laissez-faire uh, side. I'd say relatively more. We're lower taxes, uh, certainly as a share of national income, a much lower social outlays. Uh, uh, the UK more than the United States, even though it started with laissez-faire in the 19th century, the UK adopted a, a, a national health service, of course, after World War II. The United States never did that. Uh, China's a very pragmatic uh, and uh, uh, economically uh, well-governed country, uh, very impressive uh, during the past 40 years uh, because uh, they've had a uh, planning model uh, with a major role of state finance combined with a, a very dynamic and competitive uh, market sector and a very entrepreneurial uh, uh, lead in uh, many sectors as well. I was just in China uh, and uh, noted a huge rise of electric vehicles. And there are hundreds of electric vehicle companies right now, startups. Uh, uh, it's uh, expected that the number will whittle down quickly to perhaps uh, between five and 10 such companies. But uh, right now it's named to be in the hundreds of companies producing uh, electric vehicles and uh, it's a fiercely competitive market uh, inside China. Now, when it comes to the international side, China's just doing a lot of things uh, that the United States did uh, for a while after World War II, which was uh, help finance infrastructure abroad, uh, uh, make the way for U.S. multinational companies, uh, in, in fact, um, and China right now is doing that. The United States doesn't do much internationally at all other than war, uh, but it doesn't do uh, peaceful economic development activities. And uh, you, you can see in, uh, in uh, the rhetoric of American leaders, uh, politicians, uh, their resentment that China dares to help other countries to build infrastructure. You know, the Belt and Road Initiative, which is a very valid uh, and uh, quite beneficial win-win uh, program of China together with more than 150 other countries, by the way, um, is bad-mouthed every day by the United States, mainly out of resentment uh, and jealousy because the U.S. doesn't have that kind of uh, spirit to make connections uh, with other countries uh, and uh, China is making massive uh, investments uh, and working with other countries to help them uh, with developing an electric power grid, uh, basic renewable energy sources, fast rail, 5G uh, technologies, uh, paved roads and highways and many other desirable things that uh, those uh, counterpart countries really need. Uh, now Biden is talking about uh, a road project from uh, India to uh, uh, the Mideast. And he's so proud of this one road. <laughs> it doesn't exist. It's not financed. It's uh, uh, it, it, it may, may be a good idea, but it's a little pathetic, actually, to, to tell you the truth, because China has dozens of projects like this all over the world. The United States uh, has thought about one, uh, <laughs> literally, I guess they took the, the one belt, one road idea, but they took one road, one. There's <laughs> one corridor that they're talking about, uh, whereas China is doing dozens of these projects. Uh, so the U.S. is kind of looking on since I think that so IMAC program, program is dead with the war now in, in uh, Yes, the, I think that's right. And we're so paralyzed, uh, so ineffective, so paralyzed with everything, so war driven uh, that uh, an idea of a road becomes about the best that we can do and a road that uh, perhaps never will be built. Right. OK, well, look, I'll come back to China, but um, I also uh, knew that you were at the Valdai uh, Discussion Club, uh, and I I tried to, I was told actually by Richard Sakwa, whom I interviewed yesterday, whom you know, he was also speaking at Valdai, but he told me that you were speaking there on 
uh, on the question of the discussion for a new currency and a new international trade mechanism that's taking place within the BRICS. Um, I think you know that uh, Sergei Glazyev, uh, who has been a key economist in this, in formulating these ideas, working with China and the other BRICS countries, and now really the whole global South working on putting together this kind of idea. Um, and you probably know that Lyndon LaRouche, uh, that, that Glazyev has openly praised Lyndon, Lyndon LaRouche's economic ideas, and especially the article he wrote in the year 2000, which was called Toward a Basket of Hard Commodities, Trade Without Currency. So um, perhaps you can say a bit about where you think that whole plan stands today. I was not able to find the video of your presentation at Valdai, so um, I'm counting on you to fill us in. Basically, uh, I noted that uh, having uh, one dominant currency in the world, uh, which has been the US dollar uh, after World War II, and which was the pound sterling uh, before uh, World War I, um, has you know, certain advantages uh, because money is uh, just a, a means of uh, uh, settling transactions uh, for the real economy, for the, the non-monetary economy. Uh, so having a, a single currency can be efficient, but the U.S. Uh, has blown it by weaponizing the dollar. Uh, the U.S. Uh, had an advantage because other uh, countries and international businesses uh, use the dollar, and that does give benefits to the U.S., uh, so-called seniorage benefits and other benefits, uh, but essentially the ease uh, of borrowing abroad uh, and very high liquidity of your own national currency. But the U.S. started to weaponize the dollar, meaning uh, rather than letting it be used just for transactions purposes, uh, the United States used this uh, special uh, situation of having transactions pass through the uh, dollar banking system and ultimately through the central bank of the U.S., the Federal Reserve, to start uh, confiscating the dollars of other countries that the U.S. disagreed with in foreign policy. This is really obnoxious behavior, by the way, because <laughs> the idea of uh, money uh, is, uh, again, uh, as a transactions uh, medium, uh, not uh, as a hostage to foreign policy. And uh, because the dollar was so dominant, uh, even after the U.S. confiscated uh, reserves of uh, Iran or North Korea, then Venezuela, now Russia, you know, many countries use the dollar, but they don't like to use it because they're a little afraid of saying a word that's crossed to the U.S. and then seeing the U.S. government come down on them, even freezing their money. It's pretty bad behavior, in my view, uh, but basically very ill-advised because the BRICS countries now, uh, and it started with the original five, uh, with Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, but now it's going to include uh, the, the new six, uh, which is Argentina, Egypt, uh, Ethiopia, Saudi Arabia, the Emirates, and Iran. Uh, this is a big group of countries and they're saying, we don't want to use the dollar because frankly, we don't want our money confiscated. Uh, and so uh, they're going to develop uh, an alternative payments system. They will be successful at that because it's not so hard to make payments in other ways, uh, in renminbi or in uh, rubles or in rupees or in an R5 currency, so-called, because the original BRICS-5 all have an R currency, uh, the real, uh, the ruble, uh, the rupee, the renminbi, and the rand. Uh, so uh, they call it the R5, and they may just make a basket uh, using those five currencies uh, for denomination and even for lending and, and borrowing uh, in, in a bond denominated in a basket of currencies. So I expect something interesting and good to come out of this. Uh, again, it's a little bit regrettable in a way if uh, having 
a single medium of exchange. It, it wouldn't even have to be one country. Uh, Keynes had the idea that it would be uh, the IMF's currency, the Bancor, he called it uh, in a famous uh, writing, um, would have certain convenience. Uh, but if it's then used monopolistically uh, for uh, militarized or foreign policy or geopolitical purposes, it's not going to last long because there are always workarounds when it comes to trade and, and to financial settlements. And that's what the BRICS are doing right now. They're going to do a workaround. I sent you just before we got on this, this, uh, this uh, call, um, a article that uh, was published by Glazieff, I think just today, or at least recently, on this, in which he emphasizes that while the basket of currencies and the R5, these are definitely uh, being implemented already uh, in various forms, but that eventually the idea of a separate currency, maybe the R5, but some some separate currency which would be also tied to a basket of commodities uh, rather than just currencies uh, to, in a certain sense, tie it to the cost, the actual cost of production of, of the real economy. Um, and that uh, in that in general, he thinks this is something that can, it, it's basically simple to finish completing it, that he he's hopeful that it can be done by next year when when Russia is head of the uh, of the of the BRICS and will be holding the BRICS conference in in Kazan, I believe. So um, anyway, I'd be interested in your response to his his article. Um, yeah, I, I I haven't read it yet. Let me just say that uh, this is there there are several different issues involved uh, in our discussion. One is uh, the privilege of the U.S to host the international currency. And I've explained why uh, the US has misused that privilege and why it's uh, now going to uh, lose uh, a lot of the uh, business so-called of settlements in dollars. But a, a second is the, the mechanics of payment systems. And the third is the management of monetary policy. These are all distinct issues. Uh, on the payments mechanisms, we can do something that could never have been done before, uh, and that is uh, digital settlements. So we don't even need a banking system now, and uh, we don't need uh, uh, cash in circulation uh, or gold bars uh, and other uh, or gold coins and other mechanisms that were uh, mechanisms of settlement, because now uh, digitally, uh, every transaction can be tracked. Uh, we know uh, there are different ways to do it. Blockchain is one, but there are many other probably more efficient ways to do it uh, with central bank clearing, for example. And that means that uh, even the, the method of payments, I think, will likely be digital and could well be a central bank digital currency in the future. Then uh, third question is the management of monetary policy. And uh, this is a long debate. Uh, John Maynard Keynes wrote brilliantly about it in the 1920s and the 1930s. Uh, should uh, a currency, uh, whether digital or uh, physical, um, be convertible into something else, for example, gold or into some commodity basket, or should it be what economists call a fiat currency, which is that it is only backed by the policies of the central bank or, or banks that issue that currency. And its value depends on expectations about those policies. And uh, we've had uh, more than 100 years of debate about that. The advantage of linking a currency to a commodity basket is uh, it can't be issued uh, for uh, political purposes, uh, especially to finance uh, government payments not backed by uh, a flow of uh, tax revenues, for example. So you can't get a hyperinflation uh, in, uh, in a backed uh, currency. 
and that's been deemed to be the advantage that it uh, is a kind of straitjacket and focuses uh, 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 on the real economy, limits the capacity to issue credit. But on the other hand, it proved to be highly disadvantageous in other circumstances. When the world was on a gold standard or a gold exchange standard, uh, if there were long periods in which major gold deposits were not discovered, that gave, uh, on average, a deflationary uh, uh, weight to the world price trends. And that uh, was deemed to have uh, distributional and real economy effects that were not highly desirable, although it also had some desirable effects as well. It also uh, made it harder for central banks to uh, be lenders of last resort in financial panics. And uh, the Great Depression is a very complicated, fascinating and important subject to understand about central banking and whether the gold standard was uh, a contributor to the persistence of the Great Depression. Well, I don't want us to uh, get into uh, long excursus about uh, monetary theory, except to say that uh, there are several questions on the table right now. First, whose currency? Second, the technology of settlement. And third, the uh, organization of monetary policy. They're all very interesting. I spent uh, many decades studying them. Uh, and uh, I think uh, there's no uh, ideal systems uh, here which is uh, why we continue to have these discussions uh, decade after decade after decade. Right. Well, getting back to China, I did listen to your presentation in Beijing to, at, I think it was at the UN headquarters there, to, uh, I think, probably Group of international ambassadors. ambassadors, yeah. Yeah. And probably Chinese officials as well, right? But they anyway. Were, uh, yeah. Yeah, it was it was very interesting. I mean, you really focused on the Chinese miracle, the transformation of China over a mere 40 years uh, into, you know, from the one of the poorest to one of the most uh, one of the richest in history, actually, and the transformation of, of elimination of poverty and, and so forth. So, I mean, this was a quite interesting presentation. What I really found interesting was your your discussion of the idea that the Chinese model would be the proper approach for dealing with the development of Africa, uh, which of course is also very much part of China's role in the Belt and Road. Um, but in particular, you contrasted that directly to the policies of the IMF, which I thought I'd ask you to uh, elaborate on here because uh, it was a very interesting way of showing the failure of the IMF to bring about real development in uh, in, Af in Africa or any other part of the developing sector? I think to put it uh, you know, very straightforwardly, uh, the rapid economic uh, growth of China, which was uh, by traditional measures around 10% per year growth of the uh, domestic economy uh, persistently between 1980 and uh, nearly the year 2020, so an increase uh, that was more than 30-fold, if you accumulate, uh, in the size of the Chinese economy, came about by investment. What does investment mean? Investment means building the capital stock of a country. What is a capital stock? A capital stock means the productive assets of an economy. Uh, what are those? Uh, well, those are three main categories. First, what we carry in our own uh, bodies and brains, the so-called human capital, uh, that's the education and the skills and the health of the population. The second is the physical infrastructure, uh, which is the roads, uh, the power grid, uh, the fiber uh, optics uh, grid, the water and sewerage systems and uh, fast rail highways, uh, all of the uh, networking. Uh, that uh, the economy uh, depends on. And the third is the business sector, uh, the manufacturing uh, industries, uh, agriculture, and so forth. Well, if you look at China's uh, growth during 1980 to 2020, the rates of investment 
were extraordinary. Uh, the rate of investment means uh, essentially the share of the national income that is uh, invested each year in new capital. And in the United States, uh, the gross investment rate, which means the uh, amount of investment uh, that we undertake, uh, not uh, recognizing that some of it's just offsetting depreciation, the gross investment is uh, something on the order of 15 to 20 percent of uh, the national income. But in China, it was typically 40 to 50 percent of the national income, so a supercharged investment rate. You know, before our eyes, China built thousands of kilometers of fast rail, thousands of kilometers of a highway system, thousands of kilometers of a an electricity distribution system and on and on and on, really impressive. And that's what powered uh, China, that plus the huge investments in uh, education and skills. So China started uh, without much infrastructure at all. And it started with very uh, poor education levels by the uh, uh, late 1970s because China had had so much turmoil over the preceding 150 years. But then China finally, starting in 1978, said, OK, we're going for it. Uh, Deng Xiaoping came to power. Uh, he was uh, perhaps uh, modern history's single most successful economic reformer. Uh, he pointed China in the right direction, said, go for growth. Uh, open the economy, make a market economy, make a mixed economy, uh, build infrastructure, invest in the people. Uh, and uh, lo and behold, that extraordinarily high investment rate uh, led to uh, 40 years of rapid growth. Now, the problem when it comes to the IMF is that the IMF does not have that vision in mind. The IMF's vision to uh, a finance minister of a poor country is don't bother us with your problems. Uh, don't uh, get into excessive debt. Uh, don't uh, get into a financial crisis and uh, don't bother us about your poverty. Thank you very much. Uh, so nobody thinks very hard about uh, the uh, way for these countries to get out of poverty. But the way is it, just like China did, which is uh, massive investments. And then comes the question how to finance those investments. Uh, China partly borrowed in the early years, but also had a massively high saving rate internally. So uh, as the income was rising, China wasn't consuming it in, in a lot of uh, household consumer spending. Uh, Chinese households were saving a lot of their rising income. Chinese businesses were reinvesting a lot of their profits. Uh, the government wasn't running uh, huge deficits uh, uh, on its current transactions and so forth. All of this meant a very high saving rate that could be turned into a high investment rate. Now, Africa right now has a very, very low saving rate because people are impoverished. They can't save more, they have to survive. So they need some help with the financing right now by essentially some international financing, uh, say from the African Development Bank or from the Belt and Road program in which China can provide some of the financing to build that infrastructure in Africa. But that's the advice that Africa should be getting. Invest, invest strongly, invest heavily, borrow where you need to borrow, uh, get your kids in school, electrify the economy, build the roads, build the fast rail, uh, and so forth. And I think China can help to give some very good advice in that direction. The China model. Right. Yeah, China shows, you know, you can have 40 years of supercharged growth, and that's what Africa needs. 40 years. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> you also spoke at Chufu, the uh, birthplace of Confucius. Uh, which now is a, a shrine and a museum, I believe, right? A, a major site. Well, for... that temple, the Confucian temple, uh, has been there for more than 2,000 years. And each emperor has come and added a stone, you know, added an inscription, added calligraphy. 
uh, because uh, Confucius has been a, a, an intellectual hero and guidepost for China basically for 2,500 years. So it's really impressive to be there at a Confucius birthday party, which I was, uh, because uh, this, this goes back essentially 2,500 years. And there's, it's a large, uh, large complex of buildings because emperor after emperor added their own building to it. So you really get the, the feel of uh, China's very long, uh, remarkable history. Right, right. And, and you focus there on, on the idea that um, we find our common humanity by studying the great philosophers and thinkers of, of every culture. Uh, in particular, you looked at, at Confucius and Buddha and Aristotle. I, pro I think I would differ with you on Aristotle and would, would have focused on Plato rather than Aristotle, but that's, that's a discussion for another time. Um, but in any case, uh, this idea of looking at the great cultures and the history, the best moments of the great cultures, is the exact opposite of so-called geopolitics, which is what guides the Western leaders today, based deriving from ideologues like Halford Mackinder and, and other ideologues of the British Empire. So, um, which their view is that the only way to advance is by putting down the other guy, the opposite of the interest of the other, and rather, you know, and this, of course, leads to the sanctions policy. You didn't mention the sanctions when you talked about the theft of reserves, but even the sanctions policy, I, I, as I understand it, is based on the fact that people have to use the dollar in trade and that therefore they think they have a right to impose these sanctions on countries. But in any case, um, uh, China, of course, is not looking to suppress uh, anybody else <clears throat> and the massive sanctions against China and Russia and many other countries uh, indicates a failure of thinking in terms of the great cultures and what can be done with a culture for the future. So how do we restore that, that, that looking to the great minds of antiquity in the West? I think that there are uh, two philosophical points that we really need to pay attention to that are quite fascinating, quite uh, deep. One is the question of human nature. Uh, and uh, the uh, philosophers that I refer to, and I, I like uh, Aristotle personally, but also I like the fact that Aristotle, Buddha, and Confucius allow us to talk about the ABCs uh, of uh, philosophy. So uh, it's uh, getting back to the, the core ABCs. And what the ABCs, Aristotle, Buddha, and Confucius uh, had in mind about human nature is that it is potentially good. <laughs> Uh, meaning that with proper cultivation, proper education, proper mentoring, uh, living in a decent community, people mm -hmm. can learn to be harmonious. People can learn to be fair, trustworthy. Uh, people can learn reciprocity. So this is sometimes called virtue ethics, the idea that people can be decent, you know, uh, pretty good. Now, there's another philosophical strain which is deeply pessimistic, uh, Augustine in uh, Christian uh, history is the exemplar of that. Man is fallen, uh, and so uh, man is a sinner, uh, and there's uh, no way out uh, except perhaps by uh, God's grace, but uh, the sinfulness uh, can't be washed away. And pessimists in history have believed that, and another pessimist uh, like that that had a huge influences my second dimension, which is uh, how uh, people behave or how states interact. And Hobbes, uh, in a way, is a follower of Augustine. Uh, Hobbes, of course, uh, wrote in the 1600s, uh, whereas uh, Augustine was uh, more than a millennium earlier than that. But Hobbes was a the quintessential British uh, philosopher who said uh, people are rapacious, they are greedy, uh, they are pushy, they are violent, 
Uh, and uh, the best you can hope for is that uh, someone controls them from killing each other. So he called for uh, a very uh, tight centralized state for, for that purpose. But basically the Hobbesian idea is uh, that uh, you can't do anything uh, in a state of nature, but defend yourself from being killed by someone else. And strangely enough, while uh, British thinkers accepted that there would be a national government that would stop people from killing each other inside Britain, uh, they took the view that internationally, it is a Hobbesian war of all against all, that just countries fight with each other. And this is uh, in the uh, current uh, thinking of international relations uh, known as the, uh, the realist school. And uh, our leading realist thinker in the United States is uh, John Mearsheimer uh, at University of Chicago. He's, he's a wonderful person and a tremendous gentleman and a great scholar. But he thinks that countries are, and especially great powers, are inevitably uh, at each other's throats. And unfortunately, there's a lot of empirical evidence uh, that uh, this is often the case. But uh, John Mearsheimer says the implication of this is that the world is tragic. His, his most famous book is called The Tragedy of Great Power Politics, because he says conflict is just about inevitable between major powers because nobody trusts each other. Uh, you can't trust each other. It's a war of all against all. Uh, it's uh, eat or be eaten, kill or kill or be killed. And so, yes, life's tragic. And I uh, debate him uh, again. We're friends and I admire him a lot. I want to be clear. But I say, John, we can't accept tragedy as our fate. We have to do better than that. And so I go back to the philosophers and the philosophers taught, you know, you can have harmony. That was Confucius's main message, which is it's possible actually to be decent. It's possible to observe what uh, was famous for uh, Confucius and in similar terms for us in uh, the Western culture as the golden rule. Do not do to others what you would not have them do to you. Uh, and, uh, you know, if you're a Hobbesian, you say, oh, uh, there goes Sachs moralizing, but that's not how the world is. Uh, you know, I'm going to do what I can to the others because otherwise they're going to do something terrible to me and I'm going to get there first. And because I say no. Because that's human nature. That's what they are. Because that's the deep human nature. That's inevitable. Yeah, right. But I don't believe it. It's certainly not the case that we're always at war against each other. We are can be better than that. But by the way, China absolutely has a different history and a different mindset. And this is also a fascinating point. It's not just Confucius versus Hobbes. It's actually history. 2000 years of statecraft. What have we learned? Well, in China, for most of the 2000 years, there was a centralized state. This is very important. For most of the 2000 years, there was the Han dynasty or the Tang dynasty or the Song dynasty or the Yuan dynasty or the Ming dynasty or the Qing dynasty or today the People's Republic of China. And for most of that 2000 years, there was one country and while there were rebellions and there were a lot of invasions from the north, mainly from the nomadic peoples in the dryland, grassland, steppe regions, there was one country, big, big population. Now in Europe, after 476 AD, when the Roman Empire fell in the West, there never again was one dominant power of Western Europe. So there was war nonstop. Think of Britain and France, for example. How many years were they at war during the past thousand years? An incredible amount across the channel. Now compare that with China and Japan. How many years were China and Japan at war between uh, 
well, you could take it back before 1000 AD, but say from 1000 AD to uh, 1890, the answer is two years. I think it's 1274 and 1281, if I remember correctly. Uh, and there was actually one incursion a third year. Uh, now, two of those were when the Mongols ruled China and they tried to invade Japan and failed on two occasions. Once was when a shogun, a military commander of, uh, of J Japan, ridiculously tried to, tried to invade uh, China and was terribly defeated uh, in, in the Korean Peninsula. But my point is, is not that. My point is they didn't fight for a thousand years, barely a skirmish. By the way, when Japan industrialized and was the first industrializing nation, Japan followed the realist approach, sadly. Japan said, okay, now we're part of the Imperial Club. Now we're gonna go invade China. And the Chinese diplomats said, what are you doing? We're Asians. And Japan said, no, 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 now we're part of the Western Club. <laughs> this was back in the 1890s. Uh, so Japan really behaved badly by becoming an imperialist power for some period, but China never did in that way. And if we understand the different philosophical roots, uh, this is crucial. Uh, if we understand the different experience of Europe and China, we can come to appreciate that our mindset in the West that, well, it's war all the time, so China's an enemy, so we better go at it, is nothing the way that China thinks. And when I said to John Mearsheimer again, I want to stress a friend and a, you know, a, and a brilliant scholar, when, when I said all this warmongering against China is going to create a self-fulfilling prophecy of war. He said, yes. I said, John, self-fulfilling. We don't need to have that war. He said, yes, but that's how it is. And yeah. I said, no, we don't need to have it that way. We can do better than that. So that's, that's the debate. Helga uh, issued what she calls the 10 principles of for an architecture of security and development for the world as a whole. And most of them are sort of self-evident. You need education, you need uh, cultural training, you need uh, health, so forth. But the 10th principle is exactly what you just brought up, that the nature of man is good. And this is the one that's most difficult for people to accept or understand. But it's the fundamental one. It's really the issue, as, as I think you correctly just located. This is what distinguishes the idea of being committed to global development rather than global war. Um, and of course, as you said, also the Confucian concept of harmony and the concentration on, on education is really the center of the Chinese development of their own country uh, over the last 40 years. And what's now being taken out to the rest of the world through the Belt and Road. And uh, as as you know, you, we just had the Belt and Road, third, third Belt and Road Forum in Beijing with 150 countries uh, represented, um, which certainly demonstrates that they've failed miserably in the isolation of, uh, of China in the world, you know, uh, and uh, that the idea that they could get countries to decouple from China has <laughs> has just forced most countries to say, you're crazy. Uh, this is where development is rather than war and sanctions. Um, and in fact, the headline of our EIR this week is going to be on the fact that Xi Jinping offered a $100 billion new investments through the Belt and Road at the same time that uh, Mr. Biden was offering a $100 billion investment in wars, naming specifically uh, Russia, meaning Ukraine, uh, Israel, the genocide being carried out against, against the Palestinians, uh, and, and China. They included Taiwan as one of the places where this $100 billion so it's pretty clear that they're talking about a global war. Um, and 
the only question is how can this madness be stopped and reversed? Well, it, it is uh, so unacceptable American foreign policy. And what I hope uh, people are coming to understand is that the arrogance and the militarization of the United States uh, that has been demonstrated uh, time and again now over the past 30 years is not bringing security to the US. Uh, it has busted the budget. Uh, we've uh, spent trillions of dollars on these uh, horrible wars uh, that have accomplished nothing except violence and destruction and rising debt. And they're not making America safer at all. Uh, there are more and more wars that are a reflection of this arrogance because the arrogance has meant that America, American policymakers have thought we can do what we want and we don't have to talk with anybody about it. We don't need diplomacy. We just need uh, our military and the military can't solve political problems. And uh, we're finding out again and again that the military approach uh, doesn't, uh, it doesn't work to solve the deeper problems uh, of uh, humanity and uh, can't settle political issues. For that, you need politics, you need diplomacy. Uh, and I mean politics in the positive sense of, uh, of, of uh, uh, getting together to uh, work out arrangements for people to live peacefully together. So I think the failures of American foreign policy are on full display. Um, also, the ignorance of it, because I would cite uh, our national security advisor statement, Jake Sullivan, uh, about a week before the violence uh, blew up in uh, uh, Israel and, and uh, Gaza with the Hamas uh, attack and now the bombing of uh, Gaza, Jake Sullivan said, the Middle East is the quietest that it's been in two decades. Uh, and it shows uh, they don't know anything except what their own imagination is and they don't understand what's happening around the world what's happening around the world is that people want a different approach they want development uh, they want social justice they, they want uh, the chance for decent lives they don't want the militarized approach mike we're gonna have to go i uh, uh great to speak with you and uh, i have a call uh, starting right now